So let me leave that there <laughs> and go to the next term. Um, and cosmic microwave background, that's an important one. It's, uh, um, if there's a, it's probably the, one of the two important uh, observations that are the grounding place for module six material. The first is what you saw yesterday in module five, the expansion of universe, uh, Hubble's discovery. The second piece, cosmic microwave background, it's, uh, it's our, um, it, uh, our best indica uh, indication observation of early universe. So I guess a brief history about this uh, radiation, um, which is you know detailed in this section. Uh, it was uh, quite discovered quite accidentally. People weren't expecting to find uh, microwave radiation coming from space all over the place. Like no one was predicting that. Um, but a couple astronomers who um, they were investigating um, um, a noise in their measurement. They were finding, uh, in fact, I'm, I don't even remember what, what it was that they were trying to measure, but they were finding a very strange noise in their measurement that was in the microwave range. And they ruled out usual suspect like terrestrial emissions or whatever. And, um, and when they investigated the noise, they found that the, um, the noise was coming from outer space. <laughs> and, and, the, and the discovery and the explanation of that that uh, made sense to people is that was that it's the, it's the red shifted radiation from the early universe. So, uh, so if the the Big Bang model predicts that universe was much smaller before, and the universe that exists today is something that's expanded out into bigger space, then when all that uh, material, all that energy and mass was in a smaller space, it was more dense. It also should have been hotter. And when all the stuff was much hotter, it would have produced a very different environment. At some earlier stage of universe, the universe was so hot that a hydrogen atom couldn't form. Um, you had to, you would have basically a ball of plasma, uh, protons and electrons separate. They would come together from time to time, but it would be hot enough that um, some stray light would have come and uh, and just ionize them again. And what we now observe as cosmic microwave background is uh, from the era when the universe cooled down enough that the hydrogen atom could finally form and not be instantly disintegrated by a stray light. And um, so at that point is when the universe should have become transparent to visible light because when you have a plasma that, that interacts very strongly with the light, it's opaque to light. But once a proton and electron combine to form hydrogen atom, then the hydrogen gas there is uh, transparent to visible light. So, so um, sometimes we call the era that cosmic microwave background comes from, uh, I think it's called the surface of last scattering. And it's, it's not exactly referring to, it's not exactly referring to a actual physical surface of, um, it's, uh, um, it's referring more to the, the time period when the, um, when the, the universe became transparent to light. And, um, and because uh, with the expansion of the universe, that uh, that light, which should have been in the visible range then, uh, has uh, has been redshifted way out into microwave range, and uh, there's a number of uh, uh, parameters you can associate with this quantity. Um, you can kind of look at it as a kind of like a black body radiation, as a radiation that's emitted by an object that's at some temperature. And when you look at it that way, then the temperature that's associated with that is around 
oh, I forget the number, two or three Kelvin. So that's the, the temperature of cosmic microwave background. And yeah, I guess I'll just leave it there. And um, dark energy is the more, I guess if you, um, these two are closely associated. And um, I guess the quickest, uh, uh, quickest uh, description of dark energy is that it's the name we have given to a feature of observation that we have seen in the recent decades. I remember seeing something like this in the news in the early 2000s, but um, looking at your textbook section that addresses it, I think, um, what is the universe really made of? I think some of the observation might have even started in the 90s. Um, and it's, uh, so this goes back to the observation of expansion of the universe. And um, in a few minutes, I'll address it more fully. <laughs> But with the expanding universe, um, people had different ideas about what the final state of universe would be. So uh, that expansion of universe could eventually slow down, come to a stop, and everything could, um, under the pull of gravity, everything could pull together to another small ball again. That was one possibility people thought. And um, another possibility would be where the the rate at which universe is expanding that, you know, the, the Big Bang started out with so much energy that uh, the universe would expand continuously forever. Um, the the graph, pull of gravity wouldn't be enough to pull it back. And uh, we actually talk about something called escape velocity in the context of just uh, um, the astro um, engineering things. Uh, when you launch something from Earth with the escape velocity, then you can entirely um, um, entirely escape the gravitational pull of Earth. So that was a possibility. And um, and there people thought of in between possibilities between the where universe eventually comes to a crunch, where you, where universe just flies off, like the critical separating point between those two and uh, would it be where universe expands with the just right amount of energy so that in the indefinite time into the future, the expansion would slowly come to a stop, but uh, just barely. And uh, those geometries of the universe were referred to as closed universe, open universe, and a flat universe as the kind of that in-between boundary. And the initial observation was that from the Hubble um, expansion rate was that universe seemed to be fairly close to a flat universe. So people were making um, more detailed measurement to see is, are we really living in a flat universe or is it um, slightly one way or the other? And as people were doing that investigation, they found something entirely <laughs> unexpected, which is that the rate of expansion of universe is not slowing down at all because all those three possibilities that I was talking about, they all kind of assume that um, the pull of gravity will be slowing down the expansion in all cases. And what they discovered um, with observations meant to nail down exact precise possibilities that it's something just unexpected, that the rate of expansion is actually increasing, almost like anti-gravity thing going on somewhere. And the, the 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 name that's been given to uh, label that phenomenon that expansion of universe is uh, happening at an increasing rate, not a decreasing rate, is dark energy. And the way that con concept has been implemented mathematically to be able to uh, put numbers into actual calculation is this uh, oops, um, is this term cosmological constant. <laughs> this term is what gives that um, that accelerating rate of expansion. Um, so that's the connection between cosmological constant and dark energy. Um, uh, Wim. So this is uh, uh, related to dark matter. Um, this is a potential dark matter candidate. 
Um, and what it stands for is weakly interacting massive particle. And it's a, a topic of interest to a particle physicist because it's a probably, a, um, WIMP collectively refers to uh, particles that uh, we haven't found yet because all the properties that such a particle should have, none of the particles we know now are, uh, are uh, match all the categories. And, um, and so yesterday we talked about macho and it's a kind of tongue in cheek <laughs> acronym that people just made up as a contrast to WIMP. And since WIMP came first, it, this, all the words here actually have meaning unlike macho where it's just made up word. Um, so weakly interacting refers to the kind of fundamental interactions that this particle will have. Um, so there are four fundamental forces gravity, um, electromagnetic, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force. With uh, these particles, um, our explanation for why we haven't discovered them yet is that they don't interact electromagnetically and they don't interact through strong nuclear force. So they only interact via weak, interact, uh, weak nuclear force, so weakly interacting and massive part covers their role with the gravity. That's how dark matter was first discovered. So whatever dark matter ends up being should have a mass. And in fact, in this Lambda CDM model, the cold part of cold dark matter refers to the, um, the what they see in the model that for dark matter to explain the observations, that it must be um, cold in the sense that they are not moving around too fast. Uh, neutrino is potentially a dark matter, but it's what uh, one would call hot dark matter, uh, something that's moving at close to speed of light. And the kind of features that you can get with a hot dark matter isn't enough to explain what we see. So within this standard cosmological model, there has to be some cold dark matter. And WIMP is the leading candidate for the cold dark matter. And it, it would have to be a particle that's not in our, um, in our standard model. So our standard model has a certain one of, ones of these particles um, and none of these are WIMP candidates. WIMP candidates are uh, other particles. That's not <laughs> of the ones we know, that's the, so that's why it's interesting to particle physicists because it's a potentially something that we uh, well, don't know yet. I, I want to give an idea of, there are some parts of the Big Bang cosmology that uh, actually quite intuitive. It doesn't really have to involve any um, strange physics that either takes years to learn or, um, or, um, or anything really. So uh, let me try to present it this way. This might make some sense. Um, I want you to forget astronomy for a moment. Uh, imagine you are doing some experiment with uh, uh, fireworks or I guess <laughs> musicians or bomb. Imagine you have uh, some kind of um, thing way out in the space. Um, so, you know, it, so I'm trying to describe this in a way that has nothing to do with the cosmology, which involves gravity and things that are complex. Let's just make things simple. Imagine you have some object way out in space. And since I'm talking about space, <laughs> there are, um, so, so I'm not talking about universe because when you talk about cosmology, the whole thing becomes just a theory of space. So, um, so imagine you have some object, some air out in the space, and there is a, let's say there is a literal explosion. Something, um, something um, takes this ball, breaks it apart. And, you can imagine each of these pieces uh, flying away and they will have some different speeds at which they are flying away as some, um, uh, you know, randomly. Some pieces might just uh, by random chance not be moving that fast. Some pieces uh, might be moving uh, much faster than the others by just some random chance. 
And so imagine that you have as a beginning of something, just an object or distribution of particles. What you uh, expect to find sometime later is a distribution that looks something like this. This piece here that wasn't moving that fast will be somewhere around here. And this piece here that was moving much faster than the others, it'll be way out here. Still moving very much faster than the others. And these other pieces that were moving at moderate speeds, they will be all um, at some distance from the center of the explosion. And when you, so when you just uh, come to this picture and see these objects that are at some distance from others, um, then, then you can kind of imagine doing a reconstruction on this picture. You can uh, measure the distance from the center of the explosion um, and the ones that are farther away. So all these are, you are looking at them all at the same time. So ones that are farther away, they got to that place that's farther away by moving faster. Ones that are some medium distance away, they got to that place by moving at medium speed. Ones that didn't get far, far away at all, got there. Um, got there, um, got there because it wasn't <laughs> moving that, uh, that fast. And, And when you look at, so this is how you go from Hubble's observation that there is a relationship between the distance to an object to, um, to how fast they are moving, that you go back to the uh, reconstruction that all these, all these pieces, they must have come from one place that if you imagine turning the clock back, that there's a, there's a singularity that, um, that you can kind of trace all the elements back to. Now, uh, in the context of cosmology, it gets uh, more complex than this uh, very simple description because um, in the cosmology, the whole thing is a space that is the universe. Uh, so here in this description, I talked about a particular place where the explosion happens. And in the universe, uh, there isn't one particular place where that happens. It happens everywhere at the same time. There isn't a center of the universe. So, so you know, it, when it becomes a actual cosmological model, then there are things that where you have to uh, where it takes, takes time and effort to get your mind around. Um, but I, I want to first to encourage you to think about this a simpler model first, because um, sometimes I think it's easy to get lost in the more esoteric ideas. And you know those are what drives the current research. But the, the flip side of that is uh, the things that people are currently actively researching on, it's because of that uh, our, in the, our expanding frontier of ignorance. So there are a lot of things in that frontier where in 10, 20 years from now, it'll change. Um, it'll, it'll be something else uh, because you know, we've learned better in the next 10, 20 years. Um, it's uh, the simpler core ideas. The, they will still have to somehow remain. So it, with it, the Big Bang cosmology, our ideas about the dark matter, dark energy, I hope they change in the next 20, 30, 40 years that someone uh, finally comes up with a theory or a discovery that explains everything in a much better way than they are done now. Now, within the picture, one thing that won't change because it's such a fundamental observation is that the universe is expanding. The, the experiment, the observational evidence for that is so overwhelming that, um, that whatever thing comes to replace dark matter and dark energy, the, the, the they won't change the fundamental, the, the 
existing ev observational evidence that universe is expanding. So uh, maybe it was maybe so you know this particular model here, that model might not last. Maybe we'll learn something that uh, allows us to posit an oscillation. So maybe there isn't a singularity way back when. But what we do know is that its universe was hot enough at some point that uh, there's a something for the cosmic microwave background to be coming from. Uh, so, so I want you to focus on those um, uh, fundamental pieces. And because um, and, I'm hoping in um, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, we'll know more about cosmology than we do now. And, um, one thing I can tell you, which uh, is kind of pointed out that in one of the slides is um, that when the better theory comes along, this better theory still needs to explain all our current experiments and observations. And two main pieces there are one, the expanding universe or the fact that uh, the galaxies that are farther away from us are moving away at a faster speed. So that kind of matches with uh, this picture where everything comes for, from a singular point that becomes the uni expanding universe. So that experiment observational evidence has to be explained. And two, cosmic microwave background, the features we see there, which is explained through this, through this model, it, um, whatever the better theory is, it still has to explain the, the cosmic microwave. It has to include cosmic microwave background. So, so let me leave it there. I think uh, module six from the beginning was a bit, uh, <laughs> it's a, there is no need a boat to tie on there because uh, where we are with our uh, theories of cosmology is that we have two big pieces that we don't fully understand that's like, where is it? Uh, that's like, you know, in this picture, uh, this ordinary matter, 5%, that's what we know. That's what we can actually do experiments with, what we can do experiments on earth and can tell you everything about. All these other stuff are the labels we've given to things that we don't really know. So <laughs> I'll just have to tell you that's where we are, I hope people discover more stuff in the next uh, few decades.